Hi, Phoenix Rising here. And what I want to show you today is a home-built thermal, not really camera, but uh, thermal viewer. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, in this case, this particular viewer, uh, this was home-built aside from the actual camera assembly itself, which is part of a, a thermal night vision system for a vehicle. I don't know what type necessarily, but it's an older 320 by 240 thermal array. And what we've done here is we've mounted the camera in a uh, plastic electrical box, uh, put, a, put some plastic to protect the lens assembly in it, added a uh, camera grip to be able to kind of hold it and not worry about dropping it. And uh, looking on the back, what you'll see is uh, this is actually a photography loop, a Carson 7X loop. And behind it, we have a small 320 by 240 display, uh, along with some selector switches that I'll go over. First, we have uh, power. And this thing takes, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds to power up. And we'll flip it on. I'm going to move this up here. You can kind of hear a motor running in the background. Uh, the, these old thermal cameras, actually, they have a wheel that rotates in front of the sensor array to blanket, uh, kind of like your shutter would do on a modern, more modern device. So it just is a constantly rotating wheel on a timer motor. So it does take it a, a good amount of time to be able to uh, spool up and everything get warmed up and operate. Uh, what we have, of course, is a power switch off on. This is a 12 volt DC camera. Uh, I did uh, go ahead and put a 12 volt DC input jack and a switch to select external power for this. So you could actually set it up, hook it to a battery and leave it run for a longer time. I also have a switch for turning the screen on and off. Uh, this camera puts out NSTC video, which makes it to where you can actually do something with it aside from stuck with uh, buying something outright. And I have a NSTC video out jack on the back as well. So you can turn off the screen and run it to a monitor or something else if you wanted to. And lastly, the uh, built-in screen, it's, uh, it does have variable brightness on it. So every time you press the button, it'll cycle through various levels of brightness. I don't know if you can really see too much. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just kind of go over this. I'll show you the build inside of it. And, uh, and then we'll go and play around with it. And I'll show you some video... Uh, video of this thing in actual operation. Like I said, this is 12 volts, and as you'll see when we open it up, it's uh, powered by an array of three uh, 18650, I believe it's 18650 batteries, your longer batteries, like what tactical flashlights will use, which are LiPo and rechargeable. Uh, so we'll go ahead and take a look at that. So home-built thermal viewer. And that is also a uh, 30 hertz frame rate on it, so it's uh, actually pretty capable for, for something that you can build for, I think this total build cost me about $500 for all parts included, so uh, I'll go over that a little bit more when we look inside. Okay, we're back and we have the unit opened up. And this is just kind of showing you the layout. As you can see, it's not hugely complex on the inside. Uh, up above we have our thermal camera module and uh, I'll probably take a couple pictures uh, on that. Now this particular one is a uh, hmm, it's an S300D is the uh, model of the of the camera. As you can see it's pretty sizable got a fair amount of heft to it. Uh, I picked this up on eBay again it was a, a few hundred dollars for the working camera uh, it does have a piece of foil over this front port on it, so, so it may have been a refurb or somebody may have worked at it, may have uh, done something to get it working again. Uh, what I did find in reading is there's the uh, S300D and then there's an S300A. Uh, if you can find one, the D, I'm told, has better image quality, which you'll see in a little bit. Uh, again, that uh, that's the primary element of it. And it does have 12 volt in and NSTC video out. So I did have to make an actual connector to go to it. I could have just soldered it, but I wanted to have the uh, front end detachable. Actually, maybe we can 
we'll go ahead and unplug it and see if we can get to where you can actually see the uh, model number on it. I don't know. My eyes can't focus so well on the screen for the camera, but uh, there's the back of it. As you can see, I have it uh, have it firmly mounted in there. There's a close-up of the uh, camera grip, adjustable camera grip, which uh, also the way this is designed, I'm, I'm, I'll hold it with my right hand, but if you wanted to do it with your left, uh, you could actually flip the back over and hold it the other way, so you have some flexibility there. Uh, looking at the back, here's the uh, basically a custom-made connector to plug into the uh, existing module. This is our 320 by 240 screen. I got I could have got a higher resolution display and it might actually have looked better, but realistically this is a 320 by 240 with an NSTC out, so I figured I'd keep the native resolution uh, because really I wouldn't gain too much by increasing it. There's no special electronics short of what's in here to stabilize or make your view any better. So here's our display module. If you'll notice, uh, I'm using uh, three cells in series of 18650s. That gives me 12 volts of power and up to, you know, normally about 20, uh, 2,000 or so uh, milliamps of power. And it'll run for about an hour or so. I've never really tested it. Of course, when you get these batteries, uh, really big differences from brand to brand and everything else. A couple of interesting things, of course, I went ahead and just wired up my power and my outputs. It's fairly simple wiring going, going throughout. Uh, one thing that I found when I ordered this small display screen is on the back it had this little micro momentary switch to change your screen brightness. Of course, I, that's not something when you got it together you have access to. So what I did was I actually soldered some very fine wire onto the contacts and ran that over to a momentary switch outside, which allows you to uh, adjust the screen brightness, which makes a good difference because uh, it def definitely definitely makes it more user friendly for different scenarios and everything else. So there you have it, uh, the inside of a home built thermal using an old, uh, whether it came out of a Cadillac or whatever the heck, but an old uh, thermal imaging system for automotive use. Okay, uh, this is a scene for comparison. Uh, what we're going to be looking at with the thermal camera here in just a minute, or thermal viewer, pardon me. Uh, this is just my backyard, nothing fancy. Just uh, just a basic, uh, basic outdoors. It's about 65 degrees out. And uh, we'll pan around a little bit and see if we can't capture, uh, capture this on, a th on the thermal. And maybe we'll have this uh, this uh, live target to look at as well. Okay, uh, here we are. Let's see if this will uh, work. Here. Seeing about what I would see if I had my eyes up to the back of it. And again, this is uh, this is 320 by 240 at 30 frames a second, and it's about 65 degrees out. So all the heating you're seeing is. Uh, is all just ambient. None of the vehicles have been ran or anything like that. We'll see if we can't get some more interesting subject matter uh, a little later. You can notice where the sun was shining on the bricks and see the heat line uh, on the side of the house. And of course there's our uh, kitty cat in the same position as he was. Now this, uh, like I said, this viewer is uh, 320 by 240. It's got about a 45 degree field of view and uh, 30 frames a second so as you can see as I'm I don't know how if you can see it good because this uh, we're recording at 30 frames a second but you can see it's a you can scroll fairly smoothly without too much choppiness I'll move back and forth pretty quick here and uh, that's where you'll start getting into uh, limitations of the frame rate on the, on the camera which is uh, pretty relevant on your thermal devices. Uh, some of the very cheap ones are 9 Hertz which is almost uh, almost impossible to do anything but very very slow panning. Uh, 30 Hertz is acceptable for most uses and of course when you start getting into your 50 and 60 Hertz models uh, 
that's uh, where your higher end hunting scopes and viewers uh, really shine is when you have to pan when you have something moving you're trying to observe so okay we're back and we are inside the house and uh, you're looking at my kitchen uh, you can see any electronic or electrical devices that are turned on or have any residual heat show up very well. Uh, you'll see the range hood with, uh, and that's actually LED bulbs, so they're not putting out a huge amount of heat. Uh, the black object you see in the uh, center is actually a bottle of soda that I just pulled out of the uh, fridge, so it's uh, it's showing up as cold. and. And this old technology actually has a bit of, uh, of a halo effect around objects that are, have big difference gradients. The uh, white object in the center there is a power strip. Uh, you can see me holding the camera in the mirror and that's a, or in a window. And that's another thing to remember about thermal is that uh, glass is opaque. So uh, you can't see through glass with it. And the other thing is, is that metal surfaces also, any certain things reflect uh, infrared heat. And uh, you'll see that as well that can give you kind of false images. Uh, I'm in my living room now. The, what you can see, you're looking at the walls and you can actually see these beams in the walls with this. Of course, there's a ceiling fan that's been on for a while, running low. Uh, looking up at the rafters, you can see where there's differences in the insulation. Uh, so you can use this for home heat detect, heat loss detection, uh, for your heat and heating and cooling, looking around windows, uh, a lot of different uses. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kick off my shoes and walk across the floor, or stand in one spot and then walk across the floor, and we'll turn back and we'll take a look here, just to show you how sensitive this is. And there's where I was standing. Now mind you, you see how fast I'm walking backwards, and uh, you, you can see exactly where I've been. Oh, there's, yeah, hello. About dinner time, isn't it? So, there you go. You can actually even see where the cats walked. <laughs> see my shoes are heat, heated up. Hey, there you go, paw prints. Uh, so you can see how, uh, if you've read or seen anything about scammers uh, using thermal cameras to look and get people's uh, pin numbers off of uh, off of like a keypad or something like that. You may not be able to tell what was pressed when, but yeah, it'll leave your residual, uh, it'll leave a residual for a minute. So I'm going to put my hand down just briefly, just like I was touching a keypad. Now that's a wood surface, it doesn't absorb heat real well, but so yeah, you can see, uh, definitely see how uh, this can be used for nefarious purposes as well. So we'll go out uh, outside a little later and maybe we can uh, see some deer from a distance. This isn't a real long range device because it has like a 45 degree field of view and 320 resolution. And I'll, I'll put up a screen in the video kind of showing the math. And this is something that applies if you're looking at getting thermal at all. The way I tend to view it for recognition distances and all that because there's a lot of hype around this stuff. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit too here. And again, residual heat stays for a while and these devices are very sensitive.